The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I am Al Warren. Today, my co-host is uh, our show contributor, Mr. Mike Brown. Hello. Hello. How's Canada? Cold? Well, very Canadian. No, it's actually quite warm here today. Um, I moved my air conditioner into my studio, but I can't turn it on during the show, obviously, because then it would make a lot of noise. <laughs> Uh, okay, but don't, we're not supposed to tell people. You're supposed to tell people it's cold in Canada. Right. It's really cold. And then nobody will show, nobody will come, you know. The yeah. city won't get crowded. You know? Oh, it's cold and, uh, our, uh, I guess our igloos are falling down and I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> how's the snow, the snow dogs? Exactly. You know, um, okay, so now how's the Dark Poutine going? Your Mr. Dark Poutine podcast, everything's it's going going good. really well, uh, that, and I'm doing another uh, podcast called Supernatural Circumstances right now, which is right in line with what Mr. E.T. is talking about today, so... Yeah. yeah, yeah, it might be good to get him on your show or find out some information, because this is kind of down that... Uh, a supernatural realm. So exactly, we've had people from uh, the Society for Psychical Research on, and people from um, the Noetic Institute, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more about what we have to talk about today, especially Lightbringers of the North. That looks really, really interesting. Yeah. So, uh, no further waiting. We've got our guest standing by all the way from. Across the world, nine hours ahead of us. So, uh, let's welcome Mr. Uh, Visa Iti. Well, Ita. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing very, very good. Uh, and thank you. It's uh, awesome. It's an honor to be in your show. It's great. Well, let's let's just start out with you first of all. Like, what do uh, listeners uh, need to know about you? Like, where did you get started in in this kind of a realm and writing this book? Uh, well, um, when it comes to uh, my interest in the topic, uh, like um, esotericism, occultism, all these things, um, I think I started to be interested in these things um, when I was uh, very young. I think I've been interested uh, for as long as I can remember been uh, studying on uh, these things on my own and uh, at some point I then uh, went to university and uh, eventually graduated uh, got my uh, Master of Arts uh, from Comparative Religion so I've been studying uh, religions and uh, esoteric topics and groups and persons and ideas all of these things also in, in there not just on my own and uh, throughout the years I've also been uh, also insider in a uh, some groups, so I kind of uh, know the field from inside and outside, and I uh, have lots of friends uh, who study these things uh, in universities, and so I, have a, I think I would say I have a fairly good grasp of what's going on and what's the history of the field, and and so uh, I've written some books, translated some books uh, from uh, English to Finnish, and the other way around, like this book of ours uh, with my friend Pertu Hakkinen, I translated our, our book. This book was originally uh, published in 2015 in Finnish. Yeah, it, 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 the original title was Valonkantajat. It was published by Lika Publishing. Uh, Valonkantajat is basically, well, you could say Lightbringers. And um, it's now uh, seven years later that the English translation is here. That's quite a story, a story of its own. Um, well, if I put it very shortly, it is that, um, well, a friend of mine, Pertu, Pertu Hakkinen, who I wrote this book with, uh, it was a very deep wish uh, for, uh, for him that this book would be also published in English. And um, while he was alive, he unfortunately passed away in 2018 in a bicycle accident. Uh, while he was still alive, he really kind of a friendly nudged me quite often that, uh, hey, you should translate our book. Like, um, it would be important to get it out also in, in English. I had other things going on, so um, it got like uh, postponed and postponed. But uh, when he had passed away, uh, 
I finally got some things uh, finished, 2020, and I thought that uh, now it's the time to pick this thing up again. Uh, I felt it's a matter of honor to my friend's uh, wish, Will, and uh, the legacy of his work. He was a very significant character in Finland. He worked for the National Radio and uh, was very famous for his music too and uh, journalism. So I wanted to um, honor his will and uh, his legacy in general. And um, I continued from there, and uh, here we are. Now the book is finally out. Um, so, you know, maybe let's start with the um, idea of what esotericism is and what's different about it, uh, especially with, let's say, Western as compared to, you know, what you have in Finland. We start from the kind of a basic definition, like a what is esotericism. Uh, I think the general everyday um, idea people have, it's they think it's well, something mysterious, something difficult to grasp. Evidently, it has something to do with spiritual topics. It's associated with concepts like occultism, mysticism, magic, witchcraft, superstition, supernational, all these kind of things. Uh, and uh, often also certain kind of groups, and there is a, esotericism have this idea of a certain kind of a knowledge, kind of a knowledge of a deeper universe or deeper, uh, deeper knowledge in general. Uh, this is known often by the name Gnosis. And uh, how this, this knowledge is gained, uh, it's, uh, it can be gained in different ways, but uh, very typically it's like a, it's uh, transmitted and received in groups. There's uh, different kind of uh, ideas of how this uh, knowledge is transmitted. And it's only for kind of initiated people, people who are dedicated to these things, who work with others, who do the same thing. It's only for the selected few. It's a kind of a secret, secret stuff between these kind of people. Opposite of esotericism is exotericism, exoteric. Uh, this is something like that. Uh, what you can read from a local newspaper, from the internet when you Google, uh, this is exoteric. This is uh, public knowledge. It's open for everybody. That's the opposite of uh, esotericism. These concepts like esotericism, occultism, and any other concepts related, uh, the meaning of these words have changed quite a bit throughout the history of uh, religious studies and outside of religious studies. And uh, nowadays, too, uh, scholars don't agree like exactly what they, these uh, words mean and how they are used. So they are they're changing. But uh, what I said, uh, this, I think, uh, grasp some basic, basic ideas what esotericism is all about. Um, how Finnish esotericism like uh, comes into the picture? Uh, what what kind of relation it has to esotericism in Europe and the States and elsewhere in the world? That's a topic of its own. But um, well, like many many things, uh, culture wise, uh, also like a classic esoteric topics and groups like Freemasonry. Freemasons arrived a little bit later here than. Uh, Let's say in central Central Europe, but um, nowadays during this internet time, we basically have um, all the same basic groups and uh, elements and uh, same things here, but uh, with a little bit of national flavor and a uh, different kind of different kind of history. We are Finland is uh, here in the north north. Uh, we are a Nordic country. We are a Western country, but we are kind of between East and West because we have this huge border with Russia. So, um, of course, uh, there's been some cultural exchange and, uh, and uh, all kind of things like wars. So, uh, so we are between two worlds in this kind of way, no matter that we are a Western Nordic country. Um, maybe that's it for the starters and we go deeper from there well light bringers of the north is the name of the book and um what 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 is the book about like what's the basic summary what what is someone going to get out of light bringers of the north mm, that's a good question well basically um it tells a um, popular history of um esotericism in Finland uh, from the beginning of last century, roughly around the time when Finland became independent, 1917. From there to, to, to today, 
like uh, what kind of groups there has been, what kind of uh, uh, all kind of uh, phenomena, people groups there has been, and we mainly go through this history through uh, personal histories of uh, significant persons, colorful persons, but we also have chapters that have uh, more just a theme subjects like a national nationalism and and occultism and uh, UFOs and parapsychology and uh, what's going on nowadays, what kind of groups we have and so. But um, but most of the uh, 15 chapters of the books, they are chapters about different persons and their basically life stories, like uh, what they did and uh, what was going on in the culture, in the world in general back then. So one, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a cultural analysis in, in general too, like what was going on, what was their connection to the world around in general and so it's a, it's this kind of a general popular history work uh, with a very very old, like a big frame we needed to frame it somehow like a, we needed to left out something before the beginning of the last century there were lots of interested uh, in, interesting things like uh, related to alchemy and the academy of turku and uh, kind of a witch trials that were there but uh then uh, the whole thing would have kind of uh, went too loose when it comes to framing the book. So we, d- we thought that uh, it's uh, meaningful to frame it to the roughly to the time of Finland's independence. And we look with that perspective what's been going on in, in this country during that time. And we felt that this was needed because, um, oddly enough, uh, there had not been uh, a popular history of of this topic before so we thought that uh, it's a high time to to write this book and um, i think we were right because when the book came out 2015 it was a huge success and the first print was sold out in less than a week and uh, we got we got a lots of uh, we were very well covered in national media in uh, tv radio newspapers everywhere and uh and uh, they were occult walking tours in Helsinki and Turku, and we also inspired one theater play in northern Finland. So I, I guess we were right that, <laughs> that there was need for this kind of book. And, uh, and uh, also naturally, because there wasn't in Finnish this kind of book, the same goes uh, to the English, English language audience. Where, so this, this is the first of its kind in a way. Where do you think the uh, interest in Finland stems from uh, in in regard to this kind of thing, because when I think of Scandinavia, I don't immediately think of the occult. (laughs) I'm not sure why that is, but, (laughs) but what is, uh, what is it in Finland that has made this such a stimulating book for people? Mm, Yeah. Well, that's that's a good point. Like, uh, I think what people in general, if you ask what, what comes to your mind when you think of Finland, I don't know exactly what, uh, let's say Americans would think maybe, Ice, hockey, Santa Claus, uh, <laughs> a cold weather, darkness, uh, Nokia cell phones, uh, heavy metal, uh, <laughs> stuff like that maybe. But uh, but uh, Finland has a reputation uh, of being a very kind of strong uh, occult nation. When you look at the history, there's been uh, like a very strong, this kind of image in in Finland for a long, long time. And I think it has something to do with just our geo- geographical location. Like we are so much kind of at the edge of the world. And uh, when you are in this kind of a borderland place, uh, people think that uh, in this kind of place is reality kind of blurs. And uh, those people living there, they have more magical powers than those who live within the known known, known world. Maybe it has something to do with that. Like when you look at the old map, the more you go to the faraway areas that were unexplored, you start to see in the maps there are dragons and all kind of water monsters and whatever. This was the mindset. That it reflects something of our mind in general, how we approach unknown. So maybe this has something to do with uh, why Finland started to gain this kind of reputation. Like, like, um, in, in a, like a, there was this, uh, what was the name? One English king, uh, I think James I, uh, mm-hmm. 1566 to 1625, he wrote about this topic and, uh, he said something like that, uh, magic most likely happens in peripheria like Finland, like uh, exactly, like uh, this is kind of a <laughs> un- untamed world where, uh, 
like a Christianity hadn't taken like a so strong uh, hold yet, and uh, because of that, they were all kind of demonic powers. And of course, these people were like that too. And uh, there are others too. And, and funnily enough, like the first official documents about Finland, it's, it was from uh, 1272, like a, like a long, long time ago. It was uh, who was the pope back then? I don't remember. But uh, this pope who was in the power back then, uh, he wrote to the Archbishop of Uppsala. We were under Swedish rule then. He wrote a, a letter to this uh, bishop that uh, when it comes to Finns, uh, they are happy to get the uh, like a help from the church in times of need. But when they are doing all right, they blaspheme the church and Christian faith, and uh, they do nasty things to the priest and so. <laughs> and because of that, they are twice the children of hell. <laughs> this is the first official document of Finland, and uh, to, to, to this day, uh, uh, the Vatican haven't taken its words back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, Finland has a <laughs> reputation of like a being a country of uh, witches and warlocks and shamans and um, of people with exceptional uh, powers in these things. How do you just describe the relationship then between the nationalism? And esotericism, like how how does how are the two connected? Mm, that's a that's a multi layer topic. Well, we became uh, independent in 1917, and um, so the history of Finnish independence is like a it's a bit more than hundred years. And uh, during this time of history, like a, what it contains, like a, all kinds of things, of course, and. Uh, that means that the nation is fairly young, you could, you could say, and it's been searching for itself, its identity, it has grown. And uh, when it comes to the time of the birth of the, of the country, uh, it was just like a, in 18, uh, 18, was it 32, when Kalevala, the national epic of, of Finland, came out. And this was a very strong thing for uh, growing of Finnish identity in general. And uh, the national epic Kalevalite contains, uh, well, basically Finnish myths of uh, world creation, of how to how to do magic, basically, certain kind of verbal magic, how you how you deal with different kind of elements, what kind of uh, supernatural entities there are, and there is the national like uh, mythic hero Vainamoinen in the book, and all of these things. This kind of stuff, of course, have been like a very inspi inspiring then uh, to a uh, different kind of esotericist or occult in the country. And um, not only the national epic, but other kind of folkloristic materials that we have, and we have them in abundance. In this kind of a setting, uh, there have been uh, very different kind of groups and persons uh, Occultists, esotericists, who have drawn inspiration from uh, from uh, these national moods and uh, all these things, and uh, quite many of uh, these people also in our book, uh, they have been uh, fairly nationalistic. Uh, some have been more like politically right leaning, the others left leaning, but uh, because everybody is a child of their time too, so they they also get like a political influence and uh, they live in times too, so so these things uh, mix more, more or less and, and uh, because of our position these things have uh, mixed in a, in a certain way and our book uh, tells story of, uh, of uh, quite few of this kind of persons from left to right. Yeah, I, I noticed uh, an extreme right-wing person <laughs> mentioned in yeah. notes to your book in, in yeah. the personage of uh, Heinrich Himmler uh, mm -hmm. and uh, his relation to uh, occultism in Finland. Can you sort of expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, you are talking about Uryo von Grönhagen. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to attempt to pronounce that. <laughs> He was born in 1911, died in 2003. Uh, he was a nobleman and anthropologist. Uh, he's best known for his uh, work that he did in 1930s for Ahnenerbe, this pseudoscientific uh, Nazi institute. Uh, he got this idea that he's going to, he was back then studying in Europe, and he got this idea that uh, he's going to hike from, uh, from there to Finland. Some of his friends were warning him that uh, watch out like uh, you're going to walk through Germany and uh, you might get 
you might get up in a concentration camp. I got maybe, maybe that's not a good idea, but uh, he wasn't afraid. First of all, he was, uh, I guess, a little bit pro-Nazi when it comes to his political views back then, and uh, he wasn't afraid. And lo and behold, he uh, ended up becoming a friend first with Heinrich Himmler because of an article he wrote to one German newspaper, and uh, then he became a close friend with uh, Karl Maria Willigut, who was uh, this mystic who was very important for uh, uh, Nazi mysticism and, uh, of course, for uh, Heinrich Himmler. So this uh, Uriel von Grönhagen got very, very closely involved with this uh, most important person, you could say, who were creating this uh, kind of a Nazi occult mythology uh, back then, well, right there when it was uh, unfolding the whole thing. Grönhagen was clearly a kind of a, like a, he was kind of searching for truth himself, but uh, uh, not that much is known, like how much he was practicing himself, some kind of things, but he was absolutely open-minded and looking for answers for profound questions. He was fascinated first by Willigut, but uh, kind of get disillusioned by his uh, stuff and antics as the as the friendship deepened. And uh, it's quite fascinating what he wrote in his biography about uh, what was going on and this one ritual that he described that they did together, uh, Willigut and uh, one of uh, Grönhagen's friends and uh, and all of that. And, and then, of course, uh, he came here to Finland to record and collect folk poetry and uh, to get some of these, uh, these uh, kantele instruments. It's a, it's a string instrument that are very, very traditional, classic, like a Finnish folk music instrument. Himmler was very fascinated by this, and he wanted his uh, SS men to learn to play this, so he wanted to get a copy, so they would uh, build these copies then in Germany for for uh, SS soldiers. And, uh, and Himmler, Himmler had on his, of, his office wall a picture of one of these Finnish uh, runo, kind of a rune poem singers that uh, Grönhagen recorded here. So... Uh, so Himmler was really fascinated by Finnish mythology and uh, um, this Finnish uh, folk kind of uh, uh, healers and uh, people who, who supposedly know, knew something and had this kind of occult occult powers. Then, of course, the war ended and, uh, and uh, Grönhagen came back to Finland. Um, he kind of uh, withdrew from uh, these kind of things, not completely, but... Uh, lived his uh, rest of his life quite quite uh, quietly, basically. He's not the only person in our book who had this kind of uh, involvement or interest in, uh, in right-wing politics and mysticism or occultism involved, but uh, he's clearly the first one that... Uh, Oh, I don't know if, if he's clearly the first one, because there was also this um, Sigurd Vetten of Aspa, who is also in this occultism and nationalism chapter. But, but Uri von Groenhagen is def- definitely one of the bigger names when it comes to this theme, and uh, his story is pretty fascinating. Yeah. And so the UFO craze, um, what, what's going on with UFOs um, back then and even now? Is it, A lot of people... In Finland, believe in UFOs? I think it's uh, pretty much the same here than uh, everywhere nowadays. Like uh, with the internet, um, people who are interested in this topic, they basically learn the same things, watch the same videos, uh, they order the same books and uh, know what's going on. But uh, naturally, we have uh, cases of our own. Uh, We start our chapter about uh, UFOs uh, and history involved in Finland with the very beautiful kind of folkloristic tale, uh, which is basically about uh, UFO abduction. We go from there uh, forward, and uh, one of the first persons we go through is uh, Margit Lilius Mustaba, born 1899, died 1991. He was a ballet dancer in a Finnish national opera who emigrated later to the United States. He had a UFO and alien uh, experiences and encounters both in Finland and the States, and he wrote, she wrote uh, two books about it. We go through other case stories as well, and uh, maybe the biggest 
case that we go through in our book was this Apudasjärvi UFO craze that happened from a around roughly 1969 till 1973, when it, the phenomena started to fade away. This was something kind of in a nor- northern part of, of Finland. Lots of people saw this kind of uh, light UFO phenomena that, that one couldn't explain away with uh, what, what have you, like a swamp gases or some uh, planets in the sky, and natural phenomena in general. They were clearly something else, and... Uh, Quite, uh, they were taken seriously because there were so many witnesses and uh, they were credible. With so around that time, like uh, the general uh, public was very interested in these things because these uh, experiences were reported so often. So there were lots in the news. Of course, this time, like the late 60s, early 70s, uh, there was uh, this kind of boom in the world in general. Like uh, people were interested in. In, in UFOs. Uh, we go also through like uh, a UFO to get the UFO research researchers society, what they've been doing and uh, some other important names in the field, like a Kalevi Rikunen who is a contactee, Rauni Lena Lukonen Kilde and uh, Johan Afgran who is a documentary movie movie maker. Uh, basically when it comes to how Finns approach and think about these things. Um, I think this reflects pretty well um, the thing that the Finns are in general quite highly educated. The general level of education is pretty high, so it's a kind of a healthy, open-minded, but uh, healthily skeptic, like that uh, it looks like. I think that a very common approach would be that uh, the universe is so huge that uh, it would be unlikely that we really would be the only intelligent 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 life form here here in the universe so uh, most likely there are there's something else out there but what it is uh, i don't know i guess this is the would be the common answer um, so, but of course, we have the full spectrum of people like um, like you too. It's like there are true believers, and there are those who wouldn't believe even if they would see in themselves UFO landing on their backyard. So, <laughs> yeah, we have the whole spectrum of people too. What, what do you think the um, most uh, significant um, of people or cultists that you've researched for the book? Who were who were the ones that? kind of stuck out with you the most oh that's a good one. Oh, this is a little bit also my personal preference because they're they're so different kind of uh, persons there's some more show showmen then there are some really serious serious people uh, well if i say like a few names um pekka ervast who we begin with the whole book uh, he was born in 1875 died 1934. He was a very important person when it comes to Theosophical Society in Finland. He was bringing it basically here, and uh, he founded his own organization, Rusoristi, Rose Cross, as well, and was important also in bringing uh, Ledroit, who mine Freemasonry, to Finland. He was a very honest seeker, a very... Uh, very active, he clearly believed what he was doing, and uh, he wasn't influencing only only the uh, kind of esoteric scene. But uh, back then, like uh, early last century, uh, Theosophical Society in general uh, was involved with uh, discussion dealing with society in Western countries in general. There was this uh, criticism of, about the about the structures of society, and of course the organized Christian religion and uh, all these new religious movements and ideas were coming up, and there were, of course, like a, things like a, uh, uh, Darwin's uh, like a theory of evolution was fresh new, and Freud's psychological ideas, all of these things were bubbling up and um, mingling together with the occult ideas, and, and so so. It was a very interesting time in general, and Erwast was there too, and uh, he was... Uh, he was uh, important in this this kind of atmosphere in, in Finland and and uh, bringing up these uh, kind of alternative spiritual topics to the public discussion. He was very much liked here by um, working class people, uh, and he had clearly sympathies for them. But he tried to keep a distance to politics because he saw that his work is in more in spiritual realms. So I would definitely pinpoint Ervast. 
And there are the Finnish students of Gurdjieff uh, who were working with him when he was alive. And, and they were very important, important uh, part of the very core group. Um, I very much appreciate them too, what they did, and well, Gurdjieff ideas as well. Then I would say also Aino Kastinen, the so-called clairvoyant of the nation, who died 1977. She was also very noble, uh, clearly a true seeker and uh, looking for good, very, very, uh, well, good at heart. Uh, I definitely would pinpoint him out too. And there are some others as well, like Jar Fahler. He, he was a parapsychologist, uh, had a very similar ideas to Gurdjieff and Buddhist ideas in general. And some others, uh, all of these that I pointed out, these are more kind of a noble figures of the book. And they are, one would say, maybe the more, <laughs> more boring ones, like the, there are way more colorful people and uh, outrageous persons in the book. But uh, those I would pinpoint out like a, who I uh, like a respect and uh, think that they really have something worthwhile to say. It looks like you've also gone into uh, some of the uh, uh, cults or secret societies and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, which which do you think had the most effect on, on Finland, uh, especially when you get into cults, like um, any disastrous ones that uh, we need to know about? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, this, there, there are a different kind of groups. Again, the whole spectrum from the noble to the horrible ones. <laughs> the, like, of course, theosophical society, like, uh, they established themselves early and, um, have had a important influence in the uh, development of the nation. You could basically say nowadays they are very small in number of their, uh, who, who is participating, but, um, it's an important, important group regardless that they are so small uh, Freemasons are of course big here too like elsewhere when you consider the number in relation to the uh, size of the population in general so uh, clearly Freemasons are important when it comes to comes to having influence really in, in, in society there are lots of lots of uh, smaller groups uh, that yeah are small but uh, who I would still say that they have an important influence. They're kind of bubbling under in the shadows of the culture. We have um, well, all, all kinds of these classic classic um, groups that can be found also from the States. We have the Gurdjieff Society, the uh, Alistair Crowley's OTO, and uh, Amorg, and uh, Freemasons, as I mentioned already, and uh, some of our very own, own kind of... Uh, Native groups like this Rusuri that was founded by Erovast. When it comes to the more kind of uh, bad cases or, or horrible stories, maybe the most famous one is this um, case of the Tattarisu magic circle that took place in the early 1930s. That's the third chapter of the book. This is uh, this is also the chapter that has a clearly. Uh, I could maybe say uh, being a favorite chapter of the whole book for many because it's so absolutely bizarre story. It would make a great movie. <laughs> it's like straight out from some H.P. Lovecraft book, but I accept that this was for real. <laughs> yeah. It was a, it was a book, uh, story about this working class, uh, group of five, six persons who were very, very little educated. Um, they, they were uh, channeling other worlds and uh, using uh, this grimoire called the Sixth and the Seventh Book of Moses in their rituals. Uh, in, fin in Finland, this book is uh, known by the name Mustaramat, which literally translates as the Black Bible, which gives for this uh, book a way more sinister reputation and, than what it actually is like when it comes to its contents. And well, and then they got this idea that they need to sacrifice body parts to this one spring at Tattarisu industrial area and that by doing that they would uh, somehow get uh, magically uh, a treasure from this well to pop up and, and they would be rich all of a sudden they were very poor people so because they got this idea they went to this one local cemetery started to cut body parts and uh, bring them to the spring and uh, 
Uh, they did quite a job, like they mutilated over 50 bodies before they get caught. And uh, when this came up in the 19, early 1930s, it was a huge national scandal, uh, written a lot, and uh, gained also international interest. At some point, Finnish police was uh, looking for uh, help from Scotland Yard because they thought that some British person was involved with this whole sinister uh, occult thing that was clearly going on on and uh we haven't found out who was this person that they were thinking this British person who was involved in the 1930s but a uh, good guess is that it was Alistair Crowley because he had back then already this horrible reputation and uh and um, might be the case anyway um this group was uh well they were caught and they got sentences for what they did the sentences were fairly mild, which tells that uh, uh, it was uh, it was seen that they were totally like uh, responsible for what they did. That they were like uh, not really you know, the brightest persons. So this is probably the most uh, horrific cult or group that you can find from our book. The more noble ones are more plentiful in number, luckily. Mm. <laughs> Do you have a website and social media that you want people to come and find out more about you, the book, and maybe about uh, occultism in Finland? Uh, I think uh, when it comes to the book, uh, we can be found from uh, both Facebook and Instagram. If you search from there, uh, Light Bringers of the North, you will find find the page pages fairly well. There are lots of photos, um, just basically the same photos than in the book, almost all, and they are all in color. There are also lots of other other pictures and a kind of background material that uh, is not in the book, so if one is interested and has read the book or is going to read it, uh, that um, complements the, the book uh, pretty well, and that's also the way to contact me if uh, somebody has uh, questions or, or whatever I can be contacted from there and the book itself it can be bought directly from the inner traditions or basically from any of the online online bookstores and many many also um, physical bookstores it's pretty easy to find yeah yeah well, of course we'll have all that uh, linked up as well so people can find you on our website mm. um so what where to next what are you going to work on after this <laughs> That's a good question. There are some ideas, but uh, I haven't uh, decided yet. Uh, I, I see I'm, I'm open for for uh, ideas, but right now I haven't uh, decided what's what's the next next. Again, uh, we want to thank you for being on the show, and of course, we're talking about light bringers of the north and secrets of the occult tradition of Finland. And my guest is one of the authors. It's uh, Visa Iti. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an honor. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.